Thank you, Caroline. It won't be all bryozoans, but there will be an awful lot. So now's your chance to leave if you're a bryozoan hater. Um, the two major kinds of biotic interaction today, I guess, are predation and competition. And there's been an awful lot of work done in the last few years on predation in the fossil record, particularly drill holes and gastropods. The average GSA symposium would have about a dozen or so papers about gastropod drill holes these days. It's a really very popular area. And Liz Harper will be talking later this afternoon about that. But what about competition? Um, where can we actually find direct evidence of the competition in the fossil record? Well, I want to show you an example of where we can find good evidence of competition. This is a really nice locality, alas, now mostly filled in, Kuramatsunai in the island of Hokkaido, northern Japan. It's the Pleistocene Sitana formation. And it's full of shells and cobbles which are encrusted by bryozoans. This is an example of a shell really densely covered by bryozoans. And draw your attention to the little area there, and we stick it under the SEM. We can see there the meeting of three different bryozoan colonies. Two colonies of Perella and one of Stomacetocella. And the Perella colony one is overgrowing the Stomacetocella, whereas the Stomacetocella is overgrowing the second colony of Perella. So this is an example of a, an overgrowth competition for space. Competition like this can be literally frozen in time on hard substrates, and it does offer a good opportunity for looking at long-term trends in competition, as I'll show you. So the outline of the talk is, firstly, I'm going to just run through some of the principal marine hard substrates that we can find in the uh, geological column. Then I'll do a qu quick coax tour of the main encrusters of marine hard substrates. Then I'll look at competition for substrate space, the outcomes of competition, the problem of sin vivo during life or versus post-mortem overgrowths, and then various adaptations that organisms can use to win substrate space. Then a little bit on bi uh, symbiotic intergrowths, which are an extension from this. And then a section on spatial competition in fossil communities, and then finally I'll just give a few conclusions to wrap it up. So organisms living on hard substrates fall into four major types. There are mobile things like these limpets, there are organically attached forms like the mussels with their bistle attachments. There are boring uh, forms here, acrothoracic cirripede borings in a, in a shell, or they're encrusters, and this shell is completely covered in encrusters. Now, they, all of these types compete, but the only ones I'm going to be looking at are the encrusters, so we're going to be forgetting about the other categories for now. What about marine hard substrates? Well, this is uh, a cobble from the locality, the Japanese locality I showed a moment ago, from the Pleistocene of Japan, completely covered, well, not completely, but mostly covered in bryozoans. That's a cobble, that's one kind of an intraclast, if you like. We also have sedimentary hard grounds, which form really nice uh, hard substrates, in this case, from the Jurassic, with some oysters on it. Um, we can find the undersides of corals, or in this instance, stromatoporoids, these cryptic undersides which can often be quite densely encrusted. Or we can find shells, uh, bivalve shells or brachypod shells are very often encrusted and form really convenient substrates for paleoecological analysis. Some generalizations about the encrusters of marine hard substrates. They belong to numerous phyla. Um, most of them are suspension feeders, so they're feeding on plankton in the water. They consist of unitary and colonial invertebrates, and also there are microorganisms and plants, but I'm not going to say anything about those two. They are invariably sessile as adults, uh, so that means they retain their spatial relationships when they fossilize. They stick onto the substrate and they stay there during fossilization. And they tend to recruit via a larval stage. So that's the reproductive and recruitment stage. We'll just do, have a quick look at some of these. For aminifera, they're really common on hard substrates, particularly in the post-Paleozoic. And they belong to a lot of different groups. Some of them are glutinated, and others calcareous. 
Unfortunately, their taxonomy is really poorly known. There are foram people that are much um, keener to work on free living forums than they are on the encrusting ones, so it makes them hard to identify. Sponges can also be found on hard substrates, a Jurassic example and a Cretaceous example. Most of these are calcareous sponges with fused spicules, which uh, fossilize well. Of course, hard substrates today include a lot of other kinds of sponges, in some cases with non-mineralized spicules that don't fossilize. Corals can be found on hard substrates. Here's a, a runner-like tabulate called Olopora, a Devonian, uh, that's a coral actually, a Devonian solitary coral. Uh, Scleractinians, a solitary Scleractinian, and a colonial one from the Eocene. Uh, I won't say much about bryozoans because you'll be getting plenty of those as we go along. But they're pretty common on hard substrates from the Ordovician to the recent. Brachiopods as well can be found on hard substrates. Uh, various strophomenids occur in the Paleozoic, like this little Valia from the Silurian of Gotland. Um, and it seems that they evolve, brachiopods evolve cementation on several different occasions in different groups. In the post Paleozoic, we tend to find mostly micromorphic brachiopods, these little thysidians, tiny little guys. This is only a millimeter or so in size. And they're common in environments, reefal environments in particular, from the Jurassic to the recent. But there are also, as well, some using the old terminology, inarticulate brachiopods, like this craniid, um, can also be found in crusting hard surfaces. Bivalves are one of the other major groups of uh, hard substrate encrusters. Um, cementation apparently has evolved in bivalves more than 16 times independently. And some of the major groups, with a spelling mistake, they're ostriids, placatulids, and spondylids. Most of the cemented bivalves are post Paleozoic. Certainly, polychaetes, this is another post Paleozoic group which is very common on hard substrates. <laughs> These kind of um, circular-like things here, dorso-circular or whatever they are, as well as little spiral guys, spirorbis. And they range from the Triassic to the recent. You see a lot of examples of supposed circulids in the literature from the Paleozoic, and none of them stand any scrutiny. In fact, the supposed circulids in the Paleozoic all turn out to fit within, or most of them turn out to fit within this group called the tentaculoids, and they're homeomorphs of circulids. Here are these little microconchids, which look rather like this one, if you magnify it, and here's a cornulited. Um, of course, today, barnacles are extremely common. Balanoff barnacles are extremely common in encrusting hard substrates. But they didn't really become common until about the Neogene. Notwithstanding Andy Gale's work, Cretaceous ones are not so commonly found cemented onto hard substrates. You go back into the Paleozoic, I like to think of edroasteroids, this peculiar group of echinoderms, as being almost the functional equivalent of barnacles. So, let's go on to competition for substrate um, space. Well, living space is a limiting factor for many living organisms on hard substrates in the sea. Here's an example of a, of a boulder that's completely encrusted by barnacles, and the barnacles are, in this case, on top of limpets. Um, and overcrowded natural substrates are very often found. Here's a modern shell from the Cook Strait in New Zealand, completely covered in bryozoans and circulids, <coughs> and a shell from the Pliocene of Greece, absolutely covered in circulid worms. So you can see that space is potentially a limiting factor for these organisms. We find that substrate space is progressively um, exhausted as exposure times of hard surfaces uh, increases. But not only that, even if there's unoccupied space on those surfaces, chance juxtapositions will cause um, organisms to compete with one another for living space. A modern equivalent you can see in the terrestrial environment are lichens. They also compete with one another on surfaces like this gravestone. And it's very much like that in the sea. We have two main kinds of um, competition for space. One is I'm calling marginal overgrowth, and that's where two colonies growing next to one another come into juxtaposition, in this case the red one, not necessarily colonies, two organisms, the red one has overgrown the blue. The second one is fouling, and here we've got 
it works. There we go. The larva of uh, one individual settling on the surface of the other, fouling the upper surface. I'm not really going to say much about fouling in this talk. It'll be mostly about marginal overgrowth. What about the outcomes of competition? Well, organisms like these, and those of you, the more alert ones, will spot this is exactly the same thing that's been repeated. But I've drawn a red boundary around that and a blue one around there. These sorts of organisms grow um, in a circumferential fashion, so they grow outwards, and eventually they start to come into contact with one another. And when that happens, you can have three main possibilities of outcomes. One is overgrowth, as I showed earlier. Here, the red overgrowing the blue. Another one is standoff. That's where they just both halt at the boundary between one another. And the third one is called reciprocal overgrowth. So here, along part of the contact, the blue overgrows the red. Along the other part, the red overgrows the blue. So the importance of overgrowth, of course, is that um, it can cause mortality. So here, actually, if I go back, I can get back. This is a large bryozoan colony from a settlement panel. It was put out in a Jamaican reef and it's competing with circulid worms. And here you can see it's actually completely overgrown some circulid worms. So we have mortality, which is not great for the worms. Uh, in the case of colonial organisms, we have something called partial mortality. So here we've got a colony of Microporella, a bryozoan overgrowing an exocella. And partial mortality means that some of the individuals, some of the zooids in the exocella colony are smothered and killed by the overgrowth, but other ones can still be alive. So they're kind of walking dead. Here's an example of a standoff. So here we've got two different bryozoan genera uh, coming towards one another and meeting along a line here. Neither one is able to overgrow the other. Here's an example of reciprocal overgrowth. Again, two different bryozoans. The one on here called Figularia. At this point, it's overgrowing this one here, the Microporella. But down here, the Microporella is winning the encounter. And you can look at these interactions. I, most of the ones I'm showing you, because they're clearer, are from um, the post-Paleozoic, in particular from the Pleistocene. But you can look at interactions way back in the fossil record. This is um, from the Silurian of Gotland. And here we've got a bryozoan called Saginella that's overgrowing this other bryozoan. And here the other bryozoan is overgrowing the Saginella. So we've got reciprocal overgrowth. I should just point out that when we have communities, things can get even more complicated. If we have three different individuals here from competing for space. They can form a competitive hierarchy. So here, red overgrows blue, and blue overgrows green. And obviously, red overgrows green as well. And in some instances, we have a competitive network. So here, red overgrows blue, blue overgrows green, and green overgrows red. So that produces a lot of complications with regard to succession on hard substrates, as you might imagine. Um, I don't want to go into this in detail, but there was quite a lot of work um, over the last 30 or 40 years looking at communities, not just of bryozoans, but other organisms as well, on hard substrates, and analyzing the interaction. So you've got the species along the top and vertically there as well, and each of these boxes is an interaction, and the arrow points to the dominant species. And you can actually look and rank the species in particular orders. So here is a series of bryozoans ranked according to their competitive ability. So the guy at the top, Smitina, wins pretty much all of its encounters. This fellow down here is constantly being overgrown. As you see later, you can do that with fossils. I think one of the uh, things which has held people back working on overgrowths in hard substrate communities is the problem of post-mortem overgrowth. So was the overgrown organism alive sin vivo at the time of overgrowth, or was it dead post-mortem at the time? You can see in a specimen like this, this is a boulder or a cobble. It was encrusted by an oyster. The oyster was obviously dead at the time it was overgrown by that bryozoan, and at the time it was fouled by these uh, barnacles, because this is the inside of the oyster. Likewise, in the fossil record, here's a small um, 
a barnacle that's been overgrown by bryzone from the Pleistocene of New Zealand. That barnacle was clearly dead at the time of overgrowth because it's lost all of its opercular plates. So how can we actually know that we're dealing with in-life um, overgrowth? Well, if we have intraspecific encounters, if they form standoffs like this one here, and here's a boundary between two colonies, one growing from the left and the other from the right, then you can be pretty sure that was an in-life um, association. If it had been post-mortem, one of them, the younger one, would have overgrown the dead one. There's no question. I've shown you already reciprocal overgrowth as well. That can only occur whilst those organisms are still alive. It can't be post-mortem. A nice piece of work by Ken McKinney in 1995 in which he looked at a modern community of bryozoans and looked at two different groups, chylostomes and cyclostomes. Uh, you'll hear more about those later on. And he found that chylostomes win the great majority of interactions when he was looking at live examples. When he threw in the dead ones as well, so he had post-mortem overgrowth in there as well, chylostomes still won the majority, but cyclostomes won more. So in other words, cyclostomes were responsible for a high proportion of post-mortem. The point is that chylostome dominance is diluted by including um, these post-mortem overgrowths, but it's not reversed. So post-mortem overgrowths just add noise to the data. I think if you're dealing with hard substrates as well, as general guidance uh, along this transect here from shells through to hard grounds, these ones at the top left are going to be more long-lasting, time-average substrates, and they're more likely to include post-mortem overgrowths. But going in the opposite direction, you've got more short-duration substrates where they're ecological snapshots, and you'll have more sin vivo overgrowths preserved. Well, how do you succeed on hard substrates? Well, the first thing is to get there very quickly, to recruit very quickly and preempt substrate space and become the incumbent. Otherwise, you need to engage in competition, and there are various ways that you can win space. One is to grow quickly, one is to be large, another is to build defensive ramparts. You can employ various anatomical or chemical weapons, as I'll show. Then finally, you can seek spatial refuges. So you can say, okay, well, I'm going to give up some of my space, but I'll go somewhere else, as you'll see in a second. So growing quickly, well, that allows organisms to preempt substrate space. It also facilitates marginal overgrowth. Generally speaking, the quick-growing ones will overgrow the slow growers. But of course, this is often quite difficult to determine in fossil encrusters. We can't really uh, determine growth rate in most cases. Um, another thing, of course, is to be big. And you can be big at the level of the colony, or you can be big at the level of the zooid if you're dealing with a colonial animal. The big guy usually wins out. And that's actually true with bryozoan zooid size. And here again from Kuramatsunai, Satana Formation in Japan, uh, we have Escheroides with very large zooids overgrowing a Puolina with tiny zooids. And a few years ago, I scored some interactions from this community, and we had 173. 105 cases of larger species wins, only 61 with a smaller species wing, and several, seven reciprocal. So it's highly statistically significant, as you might expect the big guys win. Oh, now, that shouldn't be like that at all. We'll skip that one. That's a Mac versus PC conversion that we didn't pick up. Okay, what about morphological adaptations? Again, a nice modern bryozoan with these amazing antler-like spines sticking out at the growing edge of the colony. So this is the edge that's advancing and potentially meeting competitors. And it's basically a Macedonian phalanx-type strategy for winning space. Um, you can also, in order to avoid being overgrown, you can raise your edges and produce a rampart around the outside. Here the edges are lifting up off the substrate. So it's a kind of security fence. But this is very much a defensive rather than an offensive adaptation. Because these things with the raised, raised edges can't usually grow much more than that. They don't get overgrown, but they can't themselves get much further. Uh, corals, for example, employ interesting anatomical adaptations. Some of them have sweeper tentacles. So when two colonies um, meet one another, one of them puts out these sweeper tentacles and starts to sting the other one into submission. 
And they also use a lot of chemical weapons, as lelopathy is very common in corals. I should say there are alternative strategies for a being on hard substrates. And these are exemplified by here. We've got a runner-like colony, and here some sheets. And sheets are, have a confrontational strategy, so they try and win space. And runners actually try and escape from competition. They're fugitives. Um, this is an example of a runner from the Ordovician, Corinotriper, uh, Bryozoan, but we also get runner-like corals, the tabulate olipora. And these guys distribute their zooids very widely across the substrate, but they're weak competitors for space. So when we actually get a sheet encountering a runner, we normally find that the sheet can overgrow the undefended flank of the runner. There's no growing, active growing zone there, so they easily get overgrown. We can see that in real life. Here's a runner bryozoan and a sheet coming up and just merrily going over the top of it, unimpeded. Or the alternative, the Hong Kong strategy, is just to grow erect and grow off the substrate. Avoid the things that are competing down there, but of course that gives you all kinds of biomechanical uh, problems that you have to cope with if you're growing up off the substrate. Well, in a sense, when you have a whole load of species like this living together on the same substrate, they're all symbiotic. They're ectosymbionts in a way. They're interacting over very long periods of time. Uh, but I want to show you some uh, more closely interacting types. There's a term used in zoology called epizoism. Uh, this is a shell from the Cook Strait, and just in here, I think in the high mag shot, you can see a circulid worm, this guy here, and it's been completely overgrown by smaller circulid sponges or residians and bryozoans, but the worm itself is still alive. Its business end is still left open. This is epizoism. And we can see this in the fossil record as well. From the Pleistocene of New Zealand, uh, we've got a bryozoan growing down here, and it's growing over some spirorbid worms. And if we look at this one in detail, that's the one, da, 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 where is it? Is it that one, I think, anyway? You can see this is one that's been completely overgrown, but the aperture end is still sticking out. So this guy could still be alive. And it's a fairly um, short jump from that kind of thing to a fully-fledged intergrowth. Here's a corn cornulitis. This is these um, serpulid-like uh, um, <coughs> worm tubes from the Paleozoic, and this thing has got completely embedded in the stromatoporoid. And uh, Ulla Vin and Mark Wilson did a paper about this a few years ago. So the cornelitis settles on the surface, the, the stromatoporoid continues to grow around it, but the cornelitis maintains its living aperture and so on, until eventually it might be fully overgrown. Uh, and one of the best examples of that kind of intergrowth is between this whole specimen here, the mass of the specimen, is a stromatoporoid, and here it's actually embedded some rugose corals and also some tabulate corals, the small circles or cross sections of a syringophorid-like tabulate coral. This can also happen with soft-bodied um, organisms. So here we've got a couple of vermi apertures of vermiform things that didn't have a skeleton of their own, which have got embedded in a bryozone. And the, there's a whole series of ichnotaxes that have been um, erected uh, for these kinds of traces. So these are just uh, tubes uh, which have been completely embedded or bioclaustrated by, in this case, um, a stromatoporoid. But corals and also bryozoans can do the same thing. So then, to go on to spatial competition in fossil communities. Um, there are numerous anecdotal studies of individual paleo communities, and I'll just show you a couple of those. And then I'm going to focus on two other studies, one that's in progress and one that was published by Ken McKinney back in 1995, and I think hasn't really had the attention it deserves. So way back in 1979, when I was but a child, I produced a paper describing competitive interactions <coughs> between uh, encrusters on bivalve shells from the white limestone of Gloucestershire. It had 22 taxa. It was possible to look at their interactions, the arrows pointing, in this case, actually, to the one that was overgrown, 
on that table, the rather similar to the table I showed before. But basically, you could then work out an overgrowth ability index. And you could rank the species according to how, how good they were at overgrowing competitors. Interestingly enough, the best competitors were not the most abundant taxa. And that's a thing that was also found, actually... Oh, that's another one that's got screwed up. Uh, that's a thing that was also found by Liddell and Brett. They made a study of encrustas on eucalyptocrinites from the Silurian. And they actually found that uh, the best competitor, they called Berenicea, sorry, the worst competitor, this thing called Berenicea, actually was the species um, which occupied the most space. Sorry about that one, that is completely screwed. Okay, so I just want to go on to this piece of work by Ken McKinney about competition between bryozoan clades. And here we're looking at an interaction between a chylostome bryozoan on the top left and a cytostome on the bottom right. Now these um, are two um, very distantly related groups of marine bryozoans. The common ancestor for them would have been Ordovician or prior to that. Uh, cyclostomes have got these long tubular zooids and chylostomes these box-like zooids. Um, here's an example of a typical cyclostome on a hard substrate and here's a chylostome. Chylostomes are always much prettier looking than cyclostomes. That's the, sort of the way of identifying them if you're not a specialist. Um, but if you actually, again, that one's been cut off at the bottom. Annoying. If you, if you actually look through, this is through time. This is from a hundred, roughly uh, 100 million years ago to the present day. And if you look at the um, proportions of cyclostomes to chylostomes, uh, the diversity of them rather, through time, you find that the uh, cyclostomes kind of have more or less plateaued and started to drop down after the KT extinction, whereas the chylostomes have continued to diversify. So it, this is a possible example of some kind of competitive displacement of, of cytostomes by chylostomes. Ken McKinney did a really nice paper back in 1995 in the LINSOC, 100 million years of competitive interactions between bryozoan clades. And what Ken did, he scored chylostome versus cytostome overgrowth interactions in 24 assemblages through from the mid-Cretaceous to the present day over here, uh, through the Cretacean Cenozoic. And the bit at the top, this is the percentage win by chylostome. So this is a 50% cutoff here. And you can see that in the majority of them, well, actually in all of them, the majority of the interactions were won by chylostomes. And it was between 55 and 75% of encounters were won by chylostomes. So they do seem to be competitive dominance. But despite being outcompeted by chylostomes for 100 million years, encrusting cytosomes have not been driven to extinction, which I think is a fairly remarkable finding of that particular study. So competition was not having such a major effect, even in the fullness of geological time. The second project I want to talk to you about is one called WABO. Um, that's Wanganui Basin Oslo project. It's been led by Lisian Lu. Um, we've been doing some field work here in the cliffs in the southern part of the North Island of New Zealand, where there's a fantastic pleiopleistocene succession, including lots and lots of shell beds. Um, so the stuff is like this when you get, and you can pull these shells out really easily. A great many of them are encrusted by bryozoans in particular. And we concentrated on several different shell beds. For the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to, well, firstly, these are the questions. The two, we have a series of questions we're seeking to answer, but the two main ones are, have competitive outcomes changed or remained stable through two million years of geological time? So in other words, if we look at species down here and up there, are they still competing in the same way? And do the competitively dominant species increase in relative abundance, which is something you might imagine would happen? And we're just going to show you the data from two of the deposits, one at the bottom, the Nukumaru limestone, and one near the top, the Shakespeare Cliff Sand. There is a place called Shakespeare Cliff that I don't think the Bard ever visited, though. Um, Nukumaru limestone is between about 2.3 and 2 million years old, and we've scored 791 interactions. Uh, the green bits are when they've won, so these are the genera, we, they're actually all separate species as well. The green bits are when they've won, and the um, grey bits are the losers. So you can see Steginoporella there wins nearly all of its encounters, whereas by contrast, 
Antarctothoa loses most of them. This is relative abundance, so Amulosia is pretty high up. Antarctothoa is the third most abundant taxon, despite losing its interactions. So that's the um, Nukamaru limestone. We can now, now go higher up the sequence to deposits about half a million years old to the Shakespeare Cliff Sand, and we have 834 interactions there. You can see again, it's a very similar pattern. Steginopera is winning most, Antarctothor is losing most of its interactions. But they're not actually swapping in dominance. They're not changing their positions as naively one might think they could do. So the preliminary findings of this study are competitive outcomes have been stable through two million years of geological time. Poor competitors have remained poor and good competitors have remained good. And also competitively dominant species don't seem to show any clear increase through time in their relative abundance. So, to draw to a conclusion, I think encrusting paleo communities offer largely unexplored possibilities for studying competition in the geological past. Encrusted hard substrates are common in many ore division to Holocene shallow water deposits. And I think when the surface preservation of the specimens is good enough, like in the Silurian of Gotland or the Pleistocene um, interactions I've shown you, when that's good enough, you can really observe interaction for space on these substrates quite clearly. Post-mortem overgrowths are not such a serious impediment as people uh, have, have supposed in the past, if you choose your subject matter correctly. I think a greater problem is the poor knowledge of the systematics of many of the encrusting groups, particularly forams. They often have very few good morphological characters. One of the reasons we're working on bryozoans is that New Zealand bryozoan fauna has been very thoroughly monographed and most of the species we have are still around, so we know exactly what they are. Limited available evidence suggests stasis in comp competitive interactions over time, both at higher clade level and also species levels. Uh, with that in mind, I think you could tentatively include that competition for space may not have been a major evolutionary driver in these groups. Thank you.